Yeah, yeah, God is good. We had an incredible time this morning at 9 a.m. Uh, one thing that we forgot to mention that I think is really important. If you've been with Inspire now for a few years or even a few months, you'll notice that there has been something missing. Uh, and what I mean by that is since we planted this church, there's been a few times where we have um, desired to kind of create a space for middle schoolers and high schoolers. And in fact, if you've been a parent here uh, and you've been here for any amount of time, you probably even desire, well, maybe I'm going to try and find a space to take my, my high schooler or my middle schooler somewhere during the weekdays and the weekends. And so I am actually excited because um, we're continuing to grow in that space. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have a passion for, for young people, you know, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, but nonetheless, we are actually going to, um, on October 23rd, so if you are a mom or a dad or maybe you know a mentor or you know a teenager, a middle schooler, a high schooler, we're actually going to have um, kind of a parent information, um, uh, uh, I don't even know what to call it, obviously I wasn't, I wasn't the one slated to announce this, but we're going to have an information or an info uh, session with parents and mentors and just letting you know there are some exciting things that we're going to roll out for our middle schoolers and high schoolers. It's been like six long years and so um, we are excited to kind of roll it out slowly, but we have some things in place. And so would you keep that date, would you mark that date down? Um, there's a QR code as well. Uh, we'll keep announcing it and giving you more details as it unravels. But that is going to be a day where we're going to introduce kind of a new phase in which we are going to disciple our middle schoolers and our high schoolers more intentionally and try and see what God does and bursts out of that. And so I am really excited for it. So mark your calendars. Uh, uh, write that down, and uh, we will continue to give you more information. Cool? Wow, that's quiet. Anybody excited about that? I, a little quiet there, but uh, amen for that. Um, but I know, I know you're excited. I know you are. I want to, before we get into today's message, I have an incredible, like, just a beautiful thing to share with the family. Uh, we are so excited to celebrate Patrick and Haltrice, who are newly engaged. Wait, wait, let me. Y'all didn't even let me finish. <laughs> they got engaged yesterday. In fact, Patrick, Patrick and Haltrice, where are you at? Can y'all just stand up? Patrick's serving today. Haltrice, where are you at? Oh, come on. You can go ahead and yes, give us the way. <laughs> we love y'all so much. We're so excited for you guys. You know, um, yeah, I said this many years ago, that Inspire would be a boo-producing church, you know, and, um, and so uh, praise God for that. But God is good, and, um, and we're just so excited to celebrate with you. I see uh, Patrick's family here. It's great to have you guys here. Thank you so much for being um, a part of this. And so just a beautiful thing to celebrate, amen? Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about your favorite subject, Work, amen, uh, work, 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 maybe not your favorite subject, but if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, you know that we are entering into a season in which we are encouraging Inspired Church to move outside of our four walls and to really become a people of God on mission in this city, to learn to know the story so that you could tell the story. The Bay Area is in need of gospel missionaries yeah. Yeah. everywhere you go. But it's really hard to maybe share the story of the gospel if you really don't know the story or really grasp it for yourself. And so really this entire year, we're making a, a conscious effort to not just preach the story, but to create spaces and places to equip our people to begin to tell the beautiful story of God and the beautiful story of Jesus and the beautiful story of creation and new creation. And uh, we've been on that journey. We've been in a series called Origins. We're gonna tell the story. We're starting in the beginning. And so for the last several weeks, we have been covering Genesis chapter one, the creation. And now we are entering into Genesis chapter two. And really chapters one and two are the creation narrative. And then chapter three is the fall. And it really answers two big questions, you know, uh, where did we come from and what went wrong? 
And so if you've been following with us, we've just been having a wonderful time. And last week, we actually talked about Sabbath and what it means to rest and how God created in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. So this morning, we're going to move from rest to work. Amen. And so I just kind of want to maybe paint you a framework or a picture uh, that'll kind of help us as we move in a biblical vision toward work. What is a theology of work? What does the scriptures have to say about work? And so just briefly to frame it for you, if you remember, we learned a few weeks ago that what it means to be human, to be human is to be made in the image of God. We were created by God, made in his image. And you see, that's who we are. That's identity. But we were also commissioned by God to reflect his image. That is what we do. And so who we are, we are image bearers. God created us and imprinted his image upon us. That's who we are, our identity. And then what we do is we are called to express that image. We are called to uh, uh, model that image in the world. And Sabbath, when I Sabbath, when I rest, I remind myself that who I am is not what I do. And so there's this rhythm we are a, a, a community being transformed by the gospel, living in rhythms of life. And so what are life-giving rhythms as some of you are participating even right now in this rhythm or this journey for 31 days? It's rhythms of outward work and inward renewal. And as a Christian made in the image of God, we are called to live out rhythms of connectivity with God. This is where our identity is established. Rhythms of prayer. Rhythms of meditation in the word, rhythms of rest, rhythms of, of stop what I'm doing and just be and know that in Christ, in Christ, I am loved, I am accepted. And I don't have to work for any of that, but Christ has worked for me. And so when we're participating in these internal rhythms, we are, we are living in our identity. But as you know, we have a mission. We have a purpose in this world. And so not only are we called to soak in these rhythms of internal transformation, but then we are called to express those rhythms outwardly in our work, in our purpose. That we are people not just called to sit in the presence of God, but we are then commissioned to leave and to tell others about the beauty and goodness of our creator. And so we are to live in rhythms of life, internal renewal of the soul and external renewal of the world. And this is what God has called us to. But sin has distorted that. And so this morning, we're going to kind of go back to the beginning. Can I just say thing, one thing from the top? Work is not evil. <laughs> Amen. Work is not a punishment. In fact, when, it's, when work is in its proper place, work is an incredible call from God for the beauty and benefit of the world. That's my premise with work this morning. My premise is that you would put work in its proper place, that you wouldn't stop work or that you wouldn't be a workaholic, but that from your identity, you would work. And you will live in rhythms of rest and rhythms of service. And so my premise for work today is that it's a call from God for the beauty and benefit of the world. The problem is we work for the beauty, beauty and benefit of ourselves. And when the motivation of our work is turned upside down, we actually become slaves. And that's why work, sin, that's what sin does to work. So the question becomes today, who, who, who does your work benefit? Or maybe another way you can say is when you work, to whose glory do you work for? What is your primary reason for going to work? Is it unto God or unto self? This is the wrestle and reality of sin in a world that's called to work. And so hopefully today you'll get a biblical vision of work 
so you'd be able to walk out of here and understand how God originally intended for us to work. Amen? So with that being said, can we pray? And then we will dive into the text. Heavenly Father, have your way this morning. I pray that your word would not come back void, but that it would accomplish everything that it has been set out to accomplish in this room. Holy Spirit, illuminate the text so that everyone in this room, regardless of where they work, regardless of how old or how young, regardless of ethnicity, culture, or background, everyone in this room, because Holy Spirit, you are illuminating the text, will be able to walk out of here saying, I received something from you this morning. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We know you've made all this possible through your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to rest in the cross and then work from that rest to glorify you. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, feel free to turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to read verses 4 through 15. If you've been with us, we've actually been walking through Genesis and we finished chapter 1, got a little bit into chapter 2 last week, and today we will continue through the process. Next week, we're going to jump from work to relationships, and so that will be a really incredible time as well. But today, we're going to talk about work. Genesis 2, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 15. We'll also have it for you here on the screen, so feel free to read along. And so the scripture, the word of the Lord reads like this. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. I love that, God planted. In the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. I love that. So trees aren't just for food, but there are trees just made that we can look at and say, wow, that's so beautiful. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Hafla where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Dilium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. It's fascinating, right? We can kind of see the geographical location of where this Eden was. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Euphrates. The Lord, and here, the, here's the thing, the Lord God took the man, he put him in the garden to work it and keep it. You have a job description there. The Lord God takes man, he puts him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Amen? If you are a follower of Jesus, and if you believe that you were made in the image of God, how God works and why God works should inform how you work and why you work. And so the, the kind of two grand themes of today's sermon is going to be God's work and your work. God's work and your work. Because God works, we work. So let's talk about God's work in the text. This may surprise you. But the first person to ever work was not a man. It was God. In fact, you could read Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God worked. In chapters 1 and 2, we read God creating, separating, dividing, forming, and planting gardens. In the creation story, God is not depicted as lazy or, or, a, or a passive participant, but God is busy at work. Some theologians have even observed God's work in our modern categories. 
In chapters 1, we see God doing what some may refer to as white-collar work, specializing in organizational management, architecture, and design. We see him dividing day from night, light from dark, and land from water. We see him organizing and categorizing as he builds on days 1 through 3 and then fills on days 4 through 6, a kind of project manager. In chapter 2, we see God doing what some may call blue-collar work. We see a God who's unafraid to get his hands dirty as he gardens, farms, and sculpts man from the dirt. God is an artisan and a gardener. He's a farmer and a laborer. And later in verse 21 of chapter 2, we'll even see God acting as a surgeon, putting Adam to sleep, opening him up and surgically removing a rib in order to create Eve. It's here in the beginning, God sets the tone and establishes a precedent for mankind that all honest work is dignified by God and that there is no job beneath him. There is no work mental or manual, that is insignificant. There is no job more prestigious or no work better than the other. Though we rank careers and though we esteem some positions more worthy than others, from the cubicle to the field, from the CEO to the day laborer, from the house to the construction site, to the factory line, all work that is done unto the Lord is very good. Do you believe that? This truth should rebuke the proud who think that there are some things they're above. You ever ask somebody to do something? Maybe at your job place, or maybe even here serving, and there's just this look like, "Mm, that's not my job. Like, I'm better than that. All honest work is dignified by God. The truth, this truth should minister to the insecure. Is there anyone who maybe might be embarrassed by what they do? Have you ever sat maybe in a circle of friends who are talking about their careers and you perceive their careers to be more highly esteemed than yours? And when it comes your turn, maybe you feel a bit of embarrassment. This truth should minister to you. This truth should temper the greedy who think that they deserve more. This truth should remind us that the value of our work is not measured by the world's shallow definitions of success, but measured by the fact that our work, in our work, we reflect our creator. There are some parents in this room that might need to repent to their children. Because they've pressured and pursued them to go after careers that they felt were more prestigious. And there are some children in this room that might need to repent to their parents because they had the audacity to look down on them because their careers wasn't considered good enough. Now here's something that's really critical. We don't just note that God works. We know why he works. Let's talk about the divine motivation. Why is God working? I think we can find an answer to that if we just look at what, what I would call the initial or like the early stages of creation. Right? So God creates, but we learn in, in chapter two, verse five, that He creates, but there's still like no brush and no flowers. Did you see that in chapter two, verse five? It's describing this place that God has made, but but there's no brush and there's no flowers. Like that's what chapter two, verse five is. I want you to see Genesis chapter one is like the wide angle lens. And then Genesis chapter two is a zoom in, but they're retelling the same story. And so in Genesis chapter two, verse five, we see that there's this space that God creates, but there's no flowers and there's no brush. But if we kind of take a step out and go to the wide angle back to Genesis chapter one, verse two, that space is actually called in Hebrew, tohu wabohu. It's supposed to rhyme. 
It's a poetry. And that's what we in English call formless, void, empty, and dark. So you see that in Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, what's up and what's below. And it was tohu wabohu. You see, in that moment, all that exists is a kind of vast expanse, this vast space that is unsustainable for human life. The Bible Project creator, Tim Mackey, which many of you might be familiar with, who was really helpful in this section for me, he also holds a PhD in Semitic languages. He describes tohu wabohu as wild and waste. It's here in this wasteland that God, in chapter 2, verse 8, plants a garden. It's here in this wasteland that God, then in chapter 2, verse 9, causes trees to spring up from the ground. And causes, in, chapter, in verse 10, fresh rivers of water to flow. We're also told later in verse 10 that God packs the earth full of natural resources. With untapped creative potential. Gold. Onyx. Nilium. In fact, he calls the gold good. I don't know if you caught that. He says in some spaces, there's good gold here, which insinuate that there might be other places where the gold's not as good. You know, we call it natural resources, natural resources but this is divine resources. What, what is God doing? What do we see him doing? God is taking what is unproductive and making it productive. And so this kind of formless, wasteland he's slowly beginning to decorate the canvas y'all see that or what tim Mackey says god is taking what is wild and waste and making it beautiful and beneficial for human flourishing you know humanity was made on day six that means everything leading up to day six is so that humanity can thrive This is what Make a Difference Day is all about. Many of you might have heard uh, Pastor Roger announce that in a few weeks we are going to be headed to one of our local elementary schools. We've been working with them now for a few years. By volunteering to help beautify Cyril's Elementary, you are imaging God. When you put a fresh coat of colors to brighten up the blacktop, you are imaging God. When we pour out fresh topsoil and lay a bed of beautiful flowers for the garden in the school, we are imaging God. When we pull the weeds, trim the grass, refresh the bark, clean the playground, paint the class, reorganize the teacher's lounge, we are imaging God. We'll be serving our community with no direct benefit to self. Nobody will be getting paid for this work. And yet, we will be taking what is wild and waste and making it beautiful and beneficial so that the students can flourish. So that the students can smile. So that the students can feel safe, loved, and proud of their school. One of the greatest testimonies that we get every year from doing this is the principal and the teacher sharing just how, how much joy the students come to have when they come back to their school and they see everything is new. What a beautiful call to image God. And no, we may not have preached the gospel that day. We may not have led someone to Christ and yet our work was faithful to the original intention that God has given man. And so we reflect him in the city as a church that's called by God to bear his image in the world. You won't get paid and it will be difficult. <laughs> you know that we're just talking to a few people, you know, serving is supposed to be difficult. You know that? Like if you feel, man, serving is tough or working is tough, like it's by nature of its name, it's not supposed to be comfortable. And yet there's something beautiful we're imaging God in our city. We're doing what the creator did in the beginning. And so he works, so we work. Because we are God's image bearers, God's work informs our work. 
we see in chapter two, verse five, we are given two reasons why the earth is barren or unproductive, right? So again, remember going back to tohu, wabohu, wild and waste. And in chapter two, we're actually given reasons why it's that way. The first reason, God has not caused it to rain. That's what the text tells us. And then the second reason actually makes this interesting note. There was no man to work the ground. And so what is, what's God doing here? Well, well, as we have already seen, God's proven in creating the garden. He doesn't need our help. And yet we see God's divine intention for humanity to be a kind of co-worker. What a privilege. What an honor. We are called to continue God's beautification project. We are called to expand Eden. And that what he did in this one space we are called to expand it as, the, as co-workers. Have you ever thought about your career or your job in those, in those ways? Now, here's what I want to do. I want to give you four directives given to mankind by God that I believe will help us kind of bring home this biblical vision for our work. And I'll give you these four directives up front you'll see God directing man to multiply. You'll see him directing man to subdue. And then you'll see him calling man to work it and to keep it. It's kind of this divine job description, right? Or another way that you could say multiply, subdue, work and keep is populate, cultivate, serve and protect. So let's talk about multiply. If you recall Genesis 1, 28, let us make man in our image. After making man in his image, God commissions man. He gives humanity a directive. And this directive is what reformers call a cultural mandate. This was God's commission for us to multiply, to populate, and to spread so that image bearers would fill the earth. Did you know that God's original intention was not for Adam and Eve to be alone? but for mankind to populate and to spread and so that the entire earth will be filled with his glory, his image bearers. One commentator said, when humans multiply, we make families. When humans multiply, amen, Richie. When humans multiply, we make neighborhoods. When humans multiply, we make cities. We make languages. We make food. We make art. When humans multiply, we need transportation and trade. So we build complex systems and structures that employ folks with various gifts from unique trades and crafts. This was what God meant when he called man to image him throughout the world. This is what it's meant to image God in our work. In the same way God made Eden for the benefit of others, mankind is called to image God in the expansion of Eden as the population increased and geographical boundaries broadened. Not everybody can stay in Eden. Here's a fascinating thought. The story of scripture begins in a perfect garden in Genesis, and it'll end in a perfect city in Revelation. This is God's intention for our work. We were called to innovate and create so that what started as a garden would end up as a flourishing city. This is what God meant when he told man to take dominion and subdue the earth. And so we move from multiply, populate to subdue. Now, the language of subduing and taking dominion can be triggering. Right? We think about that language. We think about you know, something being enslaved or something powerful exerting its will. But we have to remember that this distinctive was given to a world without sin. So, so, so what was God calling us to do? And you know, I didn't say this in the first, but this is the source of a lot of bad theology. There are some folks that have attended churches listening to even right now you might be listening to sermons and you don't even understand that this this dominion theology is wrecking you there's a lot of misunderstanding of what dominion is 
I'm going to get off that. I'm going to continue to move forward and just paint the beauty of Scripture and let you discern for yourself. So forgive me. I just, it's just a pastoral heart. Um, and if we want to have coffee and talk more, I'm always available. So what is this call to subdue? The call to subdue is, is, is the call to cultivate, to craft, to create. In chapter 2, verse 9, God places in the garden plants and trees, and he describes those as good for food. And then in chapter 2, verse 12, God places in the land good gold, onyx stone, dilium. And so to subdue then, are you ready? To subdue is to assert your will over something so that it yields its potential or increases its potential, helping it to become beautiful and beneficial. That's what subdue is in this text. So listen, let me, let me give you an example. Wild vines may produce some grapes on their own. But when subdued, a beautiful vineyard can produce savory grapes for the benefits of others. Y'all see that? Yeah. So we take what is wild and subdue it in order to extract out of it its potential. Bees make honey on their own. But when bees are subdued and beekeepers harvest honey from the comb, the beautiful benefit of honey is made available to all. Uh, marble re remains hidden in the earth, but when the marble is extracted and the craftsman begins to exert his will over the marble, something beautiful and beneficial for all is made. Are you with me? And I, I, I really love this. This is what some theologians call nature and culture. Nature is what God gives us. Culture is what we do with it. Nature is raw materials. Culture is the rearranging of the raw materials in order to tap its potential for human flourishing. You could call natural resources divine resources. Nature gives us eggs. Culture gives us huevos rancheros. My dad, I was waiting for my dad to say amen. Nature gives us sound. Culture gives us JT and David Kaiser on the keys making music. Nature gives us colors. Culture gives us art. Nature gives us inspiration. Culture gives us poetry. Above all, above all, no matter your vocation, your primary job description is to image God by bringing out potential and making things beautiful and beneficial for the flourishing of all. Do you understand what it means to subdue? Starbucks, which some of you might love and some of you might, mm. Starbucks created a traceability tool uh, that, that really explores the journey, you know, from the bean to the cup. How did it get here? And the way that it's marketed is that, that millions of Starbucks customers enjoy coffee, but they don't realize the journey of the bean. Right? And so, and so this tool, the way that this tool works is that a customer scans a bag. And the mobile app will kind of take you to the part of the world where that bean was grown. And the app will even introduce you to some of the farmers and roasters and even baristas who made this all possible. And for everyone the app introduces you to, there's also a hundred folks, a thousand folks that you don't ever see. From the pickers who harvest the bean by hand to the truckers who transport it across the world. The point of this tool is to tell the story of the bean. But there's a much greater story to tell. You see, we often enjoy a nice cup of coffee without recognizing the hundreds of people whose activity and creativity and faithfulness allowed you to enjoy the sip from the cup. It kind of brings a whole new meaning to our obligatory robotic prayers, right? Any folks born and raised in church? You know, and, and, and don't get me wrong, prayers are good, but before you eat, you kind of just, Lord, thank you, Jesus, for this food, make it nourishing in my body, yeah, amen, right? And don't get me wrong, it's great, and I, we, we're about rhythms, and sometimes you got to be very robotic about your rhythms, but you ever stopped in your prayer to appreciate the glory of God imaged by people all around the world to extract the potential from the being so that you can enjoy your sip? 
Or have you ever gone beyond that and even thank God not just for the image bearers, but for the God whose providence made it all possible? How he made the sun to shine, how he made the rain to fall, how he made the soil, how he even gave knowledge to mankind for us to be able to do what he's called us to do, to image him so that you can enjoy a cup of joe. Isn't that a beautiful story? I think from that, we're getting appreciation for the theology of work. Y'all see that? Like there, there, there's a vision, there's a good and pure and beautiful vision of work that God intended for us to have as we would image him, glorify him and benefit the world. And so we go from multiply And in that multiplication, the world expands to subdue, to extract the potential so that the world could flourish and enjoy. And finally, we get to Genesis 2, 15, the last portion of our text that tells that God put man in the garden and told him to work it and keep it. And I think I want to start with keep it because that word keep it really is just a call to protect. We are called to guard the garden. And, you know, I think uh, in some Christian circles, you know, environmentalists got a really bad, <laughs> really bad rep, right? You know, we use kind of derogatory terms like tree huggers and, right, we use that. And actually, there are folks that hug trees. And so, but I guess what I'm essentially saying, if there's anyone who should be caring and concerning for creation, it actually should be those of us who know our Savior and those of us who believe this story. Like we have, a, we have a stewardship responsibility. Like to the very point, even when you're just littering, like that, there's something in that that's disrespecting. There's just a carelessness in that. There's a thought, li- you're not thinking. That makes sense? Okay, I'm gonna get off my, again, I gotta get off my soapbox and stay on track here. But to keep it is to guard it. But I, I really wanna focus on, on, on work, Okay. Now, the Hebrew word used for work, how you guys doing? Amen. The Hebrew word used for work is the word abad, which actually literally means to serve. Now, unfortunately, we live in a culture where the notion of work as service, we've lost that. Right? The, The story of our culture presents work as survival. Right? The story of our culture presents work as a paycheck. Right? I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. Again, not my words. Sin has distorted the motivation of our work. And instead of working toward the beauty and benefit of others, we work to pay the bills, make the rent, achieve our dreams live out our vision of the good life. We've turned the original intention of work inside out and it's literally killing us. But the story of creation invites us to return back to God's original vision for work. It's an invitation to lay down the heavy burden of selfish ambition It's an invitation to see your place of employment as a call from God. It's an invitation to see your career as a holy vocation before the Lord. It's an invitation to sanctify your Monday through Friday in the same way you do your Sunday. It's an invitation to re-enter into a story where all is done for God's glory. Where work is a divine gift and a full-time ministry. For far too long, we come from places and spaces that sometimes overplay the pastoral position. And that you feel like that if you're going to make some sort of real eternal impact, that you got to be preaching sermons or maybe going overseas on some sort of missions trip. And if you're not doing those things, you feel lost, you feel disconnected. And so all all you're left to do is work for your own ambition. And you cannot connect your Monday to Friday with the call of God. 
some of us are recovering youth conference attenders. Praise God for youth conferences, amen? So I'm about to do them dirty a little bit, but praise God for that. Some of us were saved there. Some of us were sanctified there. God does great things. But some of us, we've made, we, you know, we need a little therapy uh, from, from what took place in some of those spaces, right? But, but I could remember being in places and spaces. And can I tell you this? That there, there, this was done out of zeal and passion. It wasn't done out of like, I'm trying to be, you know, evil. But there were just times where at youth call, youth conferences and events, we preached messages and sermons like the only way to make impact is to go out to the world and be a missionary. Like the only way that you're, you know what I mean? Like this radical call to, to full-time ministry. And, and, and we got some folks even in here today, but we go to Bible school and we spend thousands of dollars and then we get out of it. We're a little upset because like, what am I going to do with this degree? You know, and it was at a youth conference where you were convinced that the only way you can make real impact is if you're a pastor or a missionary. And there's beauty in that. And there's glory. And God calls people through that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in that, we have accidentally elevated one concept of imaging God over others. And there's an entire generation of folks that can't connect the activity of the daily rhythms of their work with a holy vocation before the Lord. You don't have to be a pastor or an overseas missionary to glorify God. We're called to image God by serving and protecting for the beauty and benefit of others everywhere we go. Do you believe that, though? I'm going to finish. I want to ask you a question. When you think about paradise, what does it look like? Think about paradise for a minute. I was going to ask you guys to close your eyes, but no, don't worry about that. Some of you are like, I ain't. <laughs> but just think about paradise for a minute. What, what does paradise look like? Is there an ocean, <laughs> maybe? Are there palm trees swaying from a tropical breeze? Be careful what you're drinking out there. Don't drink too much of that. It's a joke, but it's all good. Um. Or, or maybe you're fishing. <laughs> Somebody's fishing. Right? Maybe it's not the tropical breeze, but maybe you're surrounded by like a lush forest and you're, I don't know, fly fishing on the river. Um, I'm not sure what picture you have, but here's what I think I'm sure of. You're not thinking about your office, your cubicle. <laughs> right? You're not thinking about, you know, answering phones and, and responding passive aggressively in emails, you know? I think I saw something, you know, per my last email, you know, you didn't read it. I was in there, right? You're, you're not thinking about that. You're not, you're not thinking about, you're not thinking about the, the job site, you know, hearing from the foreman, finishing projects. In our culture, paradise is actually an escape from work. We dream about the weekend, our next vacation, ultimately our retirement. Yet, Genesis paints a picture of paradise, a place where there is no sin and humans are working. That's fascinating to think about. In paradise, work is not a consequence of the fall. We haven't even got to the fall yet, but it's a gift from the Father for the beauty and benefit of the world. But here's the problem is we're not in paradise. Paradise, we've lost it. Sin has distorted. And so what do we do? How do we recapture this vision of work? How do we live day to day glorifying the Father in all that we do, reflecting the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're not in paradise. What do we do? So let me maybe submit this 
counsel to you. I think we should remember the story. We should recall God's original intention. We should remind our forgetful hearts that we were created by God, made in His image. This is who we are. And we were commissioned by God to reflect His image. This is what we do. And we live in those rhythms of being and resting. And from that place, we receive the love, the joy of being a son or a daughter. But we don't stay in that place. We fill up in that place. And then we go out into a world where we're called to live a life on mission. To work for the glory of God. To tell people about the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We connect and then we reflect. We, 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 we stay and sit in relationship. And then we go out in representation. And when sin threatens to disrupt those rhythms like it regularly does, daily, we look to Christ. We look to Christ. We look to His work. We look to the work of the cross. We look to the finished work. We put our faith in that work. We put our trust in that work. We rest in that work. It's a work that tells you that you don't have to achieve. It's a work that tells you that you're loved. You're already loved. You don't have to do. You don't have to kind of work hard to get God's attention, to earn His favor. I got to keep doing stuff. I got to keep on. He, does He see me? You are seen. You are loved. The cross proves that. Christ did the work. Christ is perfect. And so when sin disrupts your rhythms, you look at the cross. And it's in the cross you rest. It's in the cross you find favor. It's in the Christ, you in the cross and you realize you are secure. You have an inheritance. Your retirement is secure in the cross. And then you don't just stay there, but then from that place you fill up and then you go out into your work so that you're not working for rest, but you're working from rest. And so that we live in beautiful rhythms, not lazy rhythms, not workaholic rhythms, but rhythms of resting in the cross and then working and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we rest and we work and we live in rhythms of life and when sin tries to bring rhythms of destruction, we spot it, we see it. And we rest again. You see that? So here's the rhythm of creation. Be, work, rest. Be, work, rest. Receive. Let the, the finished work of the cross and power go out, give, serve, labor, sweat, and then rest. And in that rest, you receive. Y'all see that? That's the rhythm. So this morning, we are going to do what I think is a perfect ending. We are going to take the communion, which commemorates the work of the cross. And so in a few moments, we are going to rest in God's finished work. And then we're going to leave and be on mission in the world. Y'all see that? We're going to rest in the work and then leave and be on mission. And we're going to live in those rhythms. Gospel-centered rhythms for the glory of God, for the beauty and benefit of the world. We're going to take what is wild and waste and make it beautiful. We're going to expand Eden for the honor and glory of God. And every work in this room is dignified. You're going to leave this place as a full-time minister. That's who you are. That's who we are.